Well, we've got a lot to cover this morning, as you know, and so without further ado, we'll move to the first slide. Uh, here we are, I have it, depending on the people back there. The Tomb of Jesus, the locations in Jerusalem, history and archaeology. What you did yesterday was just softening up and getting some information and background ready to move into the real subject today. We're going to talk about history, archaeology, and I may add, tradition. And you'll see how the whole various things of tradition, history, archaeology, Bible text, topography, all blend together to give us the knowledge we need. We have seen that archaeology has provided information about Jewish burial customs and enhanced our understanding of the New Testament text and its cultural background. But is it possible to identify the location of the tomb of Jesus? For 1,700 years, that's since the 4th century, there has been an unbroken tradition identifying the place. But is it the place? Archaeology, can it confirm or refute this claim? Let me just first of all point out a few places to you in Jerusalem. You'll need this map in your mind as we move forward. Uh, this is Jerusalem as it is today, and the walls shown around the white area are the walls you see around Jerusalem. They are Turkish. Much of them, uh, many of them were built in the uh, 16th century, during the time of Suleiman the Magnificent, by the Ottoman Turks, but are often on ancient foundations, sometimes on Roman foundations, or even pre-Roman, on Hasmonean foundations. But that is the wall as it is today. That's the old city. That is the Dome of the Rock, which marks what was the temple in New Testament and indeed in Old Testament times, the Golden Dome of the Rock, a Muslim shrine. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, as you can see, which marks the traditional site for Calvary and the uh, tomb of Christ, is right in the heart of the old walled city, well inside the city walls. That's going to be important. We're going to look also at that north wall of the city, and particularly at the Damascus Gate. It's called the Damascus Gate because the road to the north, the Nablus Road, goes from that gate north and eventually to Damascus. And outside the north wall and the Damascus Gate, we're going to look at what is called Gordon's Calvary and the Garden Tomb. And those are, that's the other possible site that we're going to look at as the possible site for Calvary and the tomb of Jesus. So let's first of all start off on the east side of Jerusalem, on the Mount of Olives, which is not a mountain peak but a long ridge, looking down across the Kidron Valley. Right in front of us we see the great Dome of the Rock, the temple area of New Testament times. And beyond that, deep into the city, you see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you may be able to see a grayish colored dome right in the center of that mark, of that ring. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as it looks today. Much of the architecture that you see today is from the Crusader period, it's medieval, but it goes back to foundations at the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the fourth century. However, the Bible says in John 19, verse 20, the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The Romans would not have cruci crucified anybody inside the city, nor would you have found a tomb inside the city. People would have been buried outside the city walls, and the place where Jesus was crucified, near there was a garden, and in that garden was a tomb, as we read in the Bible yesterday. Hebrews 13 verse 12 says Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. So what does that say about the church of the Holy Sepulchre? This is the, uh, a, a relief map of Jerusalem and the black line shows the present city wall. But the people who maintain the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, what is the correct site, say yes, but that wall did not exist at the time of Jesus. At his, the time of the New Testament, the wall followed the line that you can see in the model here, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was outside 
that city wall. So the city wall line is going to be an important archaeological factor in making up our minds. This is an old picture of Jerusalem, as you can see, an aerial shot from the very early days of uh, biplanes. Somebody took this picture. And there is the dome of the, there's the north wall right there. Um, the Dome of the Rock, I don't know if I've got it showing here. No, I don't. But there is the north wall shown by that red line. Uh, and north, as you can see, is to the uh, bottom left-hand corner of the picture. That's going to be important. Over there is the Dome of the Rock, and the Mount of Olives is beyond it. So we're now looking from the north wall, looking to, generally towards the south and east. And there is the Damascus Gate inside uh, just on that city wall leading down from the Navarus Road into Jerusalem. We're going to look at a hill there. Now, that was noticed in the 19th century. It was really not until the 19th century that people started to say, well, wait a minute, hold on. Maybe the Church of the Holy Sepulchre isn't the right place. We should look for somewhere outside the city walls. And they said there's an interesting old knoll or hill that's still there outside the city wall. And what's more, it looks remarkably like a skull, as you can see. And the, the, why should that be important? Well, if you look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, uh, verse 20, 33, it says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. The Greek word for skull is kranion, from which we get our English word cranium, the Latin for, the word, for skull is calvaria, from which we get our word calvary. And you'll see in the NIV, the word calvary is nowhere in the Bible. It's from the Latin Vulgate translation, and from there it made its way into the King James Version. It's calvaria, meaning Latin for a skull. You can also use the word Latin calva as well. It's a, it's a long and a short version of the word in Latin. So, this is the hill as it looks today, and on top, it's not a very large hillock. On top of it, there is a Muslim cemetery. Um, and it was suggested that the crosses could have been up on the top there, and that was Skull Hill. And in front of it, there is a bus station today. And you can see the Skull Hill just behind it there. Um, in John 19, verses 41 and 42, we read, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish, Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So there should be a tomb close to the place of crucifixion. If you, we find the one, we might find the other. There is the place marked as a possibility for Calvary, Skull Hill, let's call it that. And nearby, just next to it, there is a garden tomb. And that was unearthed. It was first cleared in by the owner, a Greek uh, uh, peasant man, and he cleared that in about 1867. And there was a, the cliff face, and an opening in it, and that opening was into a tomb. General Gordon, Major General Charles Gordon, was a British war hero uh, of almost mythological standing. Uh, a, he was the, the uh, archetype hero of the Victorian English. And he became an evangelical Christian in 1854, became rather a mystical a uh, kind of a Christian, some of his views were a little strange. Uh, if I, I could expound on that if we had time, but let's just say he visited Palestine, as it was then called, under the Turks. He visited that in the year 1882 to 1883, and he, for various other typological reasons, was absolutely convinced that the Skull Hill was Calvary of the Bible, and since then it has become known as Gordon's Calvary, though he was not the first to identify that. Um, 
The tomb has since been, uh, uh, stone blocks have been, it's been changed. Stone blocks have been built in to close it up and give a, a door, proper door or entrance. That's a modern addition. It had been obviously originally a small entrance into it and had been changed over the years. Um, and a garden has been grown around it. It is called the garden tomb. If you go to Israel, you'll almost certainly visit it at some time. <laughs> Uh, a wine press was discovered there, which seemed to lay uh, further emphasis on this being a garden, give credence to that idea, an ancient wine press. Uh, and uh, outside the entrance, there is a trough. And people said, ah, a trough. In that, maybe the stone went to close the entrance. So the case was starting to build for the garden tomb. Now, I'm showing you first a schematic of the garden tomb, and this is very important. I want you to fix this in your mind because we're going to come back to it later, and it's going to be critical as to whether it is the place or isn't. You can see the entrances at the bottom, where well, you show at the bottom of the screen. You step into one rock cut to, uh, room, which we call the antechamber. You turn right and go down over a couple of small steps with a little wall on each side. The walls are here and here, into a second chamber, and there are three burial troughs, C, F, and G. If I show you a proper plan of the tomb, it shows it a little more clearly. Um, this, enter, into the antechamber, turn right. They put an iron railing across that area now. It wasn't there uh, when I, indeed, when I first went there, I don't remember it being there, but that was a long time ago. Um, and then into the second room, and there you have F and G, and to the left side, the trough, burial trough number, uh, letter C. Let us have a look at this tomb then and examine it in a little more detail. This is standing in the entrance uh, room uh, and looking into the area where the three troughs are. Look through the rail, and there you can see burial troughs F and G. And if we look to the left, we can see the burial trough number or lettered C. Um, as you can see, they're not, it's not an arcosolium, nor is it a slab, as we suggested yesterday. It is something totally different. Totally different kind of grave. It's a trough and a groove where a stone slab would have been inserted and then another one placed over the top, making it like a sarcophagus, completely enclosing. Very different burial style. That's going to be important. On the wall, there are Byzantine symbols um, you, across... And just below the cross, on the left side, Alpha, on the right side, Omega. And there, it's hard to see, but there are letters above the arm of the cross as well. Can you see it clearly? <coughs> There's the cross, one, and the cross arm, Alpha, Omega. And here are the letters for Jesus, again, in Greek. This is Byzantine. So much, much later, after, well after Christ, of course. Fifth or sixth century after Christ. Outside, let's look at that trough. Closer examination reveals the fact that it would not have been a trough for a stone. It would not have contained a stone. It would not have been suitable for that. It was cut at a later date and seems to be a trough for feeding animals when the area may have been used as a stable, maybe in uh, Byzantine times or by the Crusaders. If we go inside the garden tomb and look at the ceiling and the walls very carefully, we see something even more important, and that is the chisel marks, the marks left by the stonemasons when they cut it out. Let me explain. These are modern stonemasons' chisels. The top one is a smooth, has a smooth end, and the bottom one is toothed. In biblical times... Uh, stonemasons' chisels, like the top one, were used in Old Testament times. But in the Roman, well, late Hellenistic, Herodian, and Roman periods, they used a tooth chisel like the one at the bottom. 
The marks on the inside of the garden tomb are very clearly the top kind. And Alan Millard, uh, who's an evangelical Christian and a well-known archaeologist and biblical scholar in his little book, uh, Discoveries from the Time of Jesus, says this regarding the garden tomb. The marks left by the stonecutter's tools are still visible on the walls of the tomb where the wall and ceiling meet. Single, long strokes. In contrast, the tombs of the first century were normally worked with a tooth chisel, which left groups of small parallel lines in the stone. None of these is evident in the walls of the garden tomb. The conclusion is unavoidable. The garden tomb is not a first century tomb. More and more discoveries point to it being much older, as old as the 8th or 7th centuries BC, the days of Isaiah or Jeremiah. A typical first century tomb plan is this. I showed it to you yesterday. The kokim, which are, or loculi, which are carved as shafts into the walls of the central chamber. Not at all like the schematic or plan that I showed you of the garden tomb. However, if we go out of the garden tomb, take a right-hand turn, turn right again into Nablus Road, and go up to, I think it's number six, you'll find there the École Biblique, which is the French um, uh, archaeological institute, if you wish. Uh, in Jerusalem has been there for a very long time. And there is a very, a very ancient church called St. Stephen's, or they call it Saint Etienne. And Saint Etienne goes way, way, way back. It's a very old church. And behind Saint Etienne, there are tombs. Now, what we've done is we've walked around the edge of Skull Hill and come round to the back of the same hill. When we get into these tombs, we are, if you could go straight through the rock, only a few yards away from the back of the garden tomb. We've looped right round. This is the same hill, and it's the same group of tombs. Look at the way those tombs are shaped. Does that look familiar? It ought to. That was the garden tomb. And these tombs are, without question, Iron Age II. We're dealing with the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah, 8th century BC or so, 8th to 7th century BC, which again confirms that the garden tomb is not a tomb of the Roman period at all. It was not a new tomb. In fact, it was a very, very old tomb, several hundred years old at the time of Christ. So in that case, it's not the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But several lines of, ar of, lines, uh, several lines of evidence argue decisively against this identification with the tomb of Jesus. This is a quote from John McRae in his book, Biblical uh, Archaeology in the New Testament. People were asking yesterday about books, and this is one I'd recommend. It's here. I'll put it on the table afterwards. Um, he says, although it was altered in the Byzantine period, the evidence leads to the conclusion that the garden tomb is from Iron Age II. Now, what about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? There's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We're looking from the garden tomb back to the wall, the north wall of Jerusalem. You see it on the left side of the picture, the, the north wall of the city, and the tomb inside. But that, I, we thought, was inside the walls. So that couldn't be the place, or could it? This is the picture you've seen before. Old Jerusalem, the north wall of the city, and the Damascus Gate. Let's look at that Damascus Gate. There is an old picture of it. The structure that you see now is from the time of Suleiman the Magnificent in the 16th century AD, the time when Queen Elizabeth was ruling in England, Queen Elizabeth I. And some early digs down alongside the wall discovered under the ground the top of a Roman arch. So they said, there you are. The wall was there in Roman times. 
I agree. That's indisputable. But which Roman time? Rome ruled for a long time. It is Roman. But let's look again. That all got filled in and covered up. And when the first time I went through the Damascus Gate, which was when this photo was taken in 1963, uh, some of your parents were quite young then. Um, <laughs> 1963 was my first visit. Going through the Damascus Gate, um, none of that Roman stuff was visible. But when I came back some years later in 66, it had changed. Excavations had taken place, and there on the left side of that bridge, which is now built across the archaeological dig, you can see that Roman arch. There you see it on the left, below ground level, going, take, taking the earlier street level much lower down to Roman times. It was excavated by J.B. Hennessy of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. And I remember the day when in the British Museum, in a private lecture, in a lecture room in the British Museum, when Hennessy gave his report. Because this was vital, uh, and for me particularly, going through all this in my head so long ago, I wanted to hear what was the result of that dig. I think I may still have kept my invitation card from that uh, lecture. It was very important to me. And I'll show you the results of it. Dr Let me first of all give a little bit of history and we'll come back to the lecture. Jerusalem, as you know, was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. And in fact, this is the carving on the inside of the Arch of Titus. It's a, actually a plaster cast the, because the original sculpture has deteriorated even further. In the Arch of Titus in Rome, um, and it shows them carrying the, Roman, the, the golden candlestick, the menorah, taken from the temple in Jerusalem into the city of Rome uh, to the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus Capitolinus as trophy. And the table of showbread is there, and the, gold, the silver trumpets from the Jewish temple. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, and Jerusalem remained a ruin from the year 70, when the Romans destroyed it, to the year 135, when the Romans rebuilt it. It was rebuilt by the Roman Empire, Emperor Hadrian. He gave the city a new name, Aelia Capitolina. Uh, Aelius was his family name. Capitolina, because Jerusalem was no longer had a Jewish temple, it was dedicated to the Roman god, Jupiter Optimus Maximus Capitolinus, uh, along uh, with the goddess Venus. This was the year 135 AD. Now, the arch which was found below the Damascus Gate is obviously, as I'll show to you, the left side arch of a triple arch of Roman times, the rest of which has completely disappeared from the time of Hadrian. Can you see here, there is the arch, and there are the bases of two columns which went up the side. Let me show you. This is an arch built by Hadrian in Jerash in Jordan in the years 129 to 135. Look at the left side arch there. Does that look familiar? Could have been the same architect. Without question, the walls which have been excavated by the British around the Damascus Gate are the walls of Aelia Capitolina, 135, a whole century after the crucifixion. So that rather knocks down some of the argument. But suppose they'd been there earlier, before Jerusalem was destroyed. What about that? Had to look at that possibility. Well, 24 feet below street level were the occupation levels of the first century AD. Buried in the first road to be constructed was a coin. 
That's great. If you find a coin buried in the road, then that road had to be built after that coin was issued. Because you can't bury a coin that doesn't yet exist. Right? And the coin found inside the road of that that was there is dated A.D. 42 to 43, Herod Agrippa II, which is a full decade after the crucifixion. And associated with this road, but constructed after it, were the foundations of a city gate and wall. And below this level were fields and a few burials, and the burials would be outside the city. Therefore, the argument against the traditional site being inside the walled city does not stand. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there it is, is the, there's the location of the Damascus Gate inside the Red Ring. There is the location of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Where was the wall? Precisely at that time, we don't know. But at least it is quite possible, maybe even probable, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was outside, but close to, the old city wall. <clears throat> so here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. A great dome, as you can see. Just a church building, not much to see. I showed you yesterday a possible reconstruction based on the work of Shimon Gibson with a slight, a few alterations of the tomb of Jesus. It was cut out of a hillside, possibly, I would suggest, a rock quarry which went back to earlier times. When the, uh, the Romans rebuilt Jerusalem, Hadrian built a temple to the Roman goddess Venus over the tomb of Jesus. That is the Christian history and tradition. And we'll come back to look at that in a few moments. When in the 4th century, Constantine professed conversion to Christianity, he wanted to build a Christian church over the tomb of Jesus. But how could he? So, he did not come personally, but his men went to Jerusalem and the bish Christian bishop of Jerusalem was a man called Macarius. And he took, they took them to the spot, the Christians took them there, and they said, dig here, under the temple to Venus. Destroy the temple to Venus, take it out of the way, dig down below ground level, you'll find a Jewish tomb from the first century. It's the tomb of Christ. So they did dig down, and they did find a Jewish tomb. And here is what Eusebius says. Now, Eusebius was the Christian bishop of Caesarea. You know where Caesarea is. You've done your biblical studies in Palestine. And he was a contemporary of Constantine, lived in the 4th century. And he wrote A Life of Constantine. I've got a translation of it here with me this morning. And he says this, in time past, certain godless and impious persons had brought a quantity of earth and covered the entire spot. Then, having raised this to a moderate height, they paved it with stone, concealing the holy cave, building a gloomy shrine of lifeless idols to the impure spirit whom they call Venus, and offering detestable oblations therein on profane altars. These were cast down. And the dwelling places of error with the statues and the evil spirit which they represented were overthrown and utterly destroyed. The emperor directed that the ground itself should be dug up and the venerable and hallowed monument of our Savior's resurrection was discovered, a testimony to the resurrection of the Savior clearer than any voice could give. He, he's very... Um, fulsome in his praise of the emperor. I mean, it gets a bit sickening at times, but I've cut most of that out. What Constantine did was to separate the tomb. How shall I describe this? Imagine the tomb is cut out of the hillside. 
you then drive a channel into the hill on each side and round the back, thus isolating the rock in which the tomb exists. Then remove the rest of the hill, leaving a great lump of rock and the tomb within it. You then trim off the sides to make a kind of sort of geometrical shape, as you can see there, build a little porch in front and a few steps going up, and you've got what is called an edicule. An edicule is a small, a, sh a small built shrine, and we call it the edicule of the anastasis. Anastasis is simply Greek for resurrection. And this is, what it, this is a model I made built on plans and drawings supplied from by archaeologists from various publications and, and papers that I've researched. And that building itself was then placed inside a rotunda, a circle uh, building of columns with a dome on top of that. So it was like a inside a church, inside a church. And this is the martyrium of the time of Constantine as it may have looked. With the tomb Inside here, under the anastasis, a rock which they associated with Calvary being left intact out here, the church of the witness or martyrium here, and the cardo or the main street going past there. So today you have that dome. Now that doesn't mean it's the same dome built by Constantine. The church was wrecked by the Muslims at one point and rebuilt by the Crusaders. That's another story. If you look at it, imagine this line above the sort of yellowish area is the line of the hill as it would have been at the time of Christ, approximately. It's guesswork. This was all cut away except this lump of rock, which is shown in a gray area here, which is referred to as Calvary. And the entrance to the tomb, which would have gone under the hill there, that rock was all removed, and that is the edicule there on the left side. And then a huge dome over the top of it. There is the edicule of the Anastasis then, the alleged site of Christ's tomb. And there is the alleged site of Golgotha or Calvary, from the time of Constantine onwards at least. Well, can archaeology tell us anything? It tells us a few things. First of all, excavations under the site that they called Calvary did indeed show a rock spur, well, and that there was a fissure going down through it from an earthquake at some time, which is interesting because we did, the Bible says there was an earthquake at the time, but we don't know that doesn't prove anything. Over the top, if you go up, it looks like this. Altars, gold, pictures, incense, candlesticks. Excuse me, it's a complete mess. They take you there and say, this is Calvary. And you say, really? But that, there it is. Now, let's take another look at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this time, uh, I'm looking at it from inside. Let me go back one. Do you see the arrow? The arrow shows the angle here that we're going to have the t look at the tomb. Go up inside the dome, look down, and we're inside the dome looking down at the edicule. Now, that edicule is from the 19th century. Why? Because in the Middle Ages, the uh, mad caliph of uh, Egypt, Hakim, a Muslim, he was later killed by the Muslims because I think he claimed to be Allah eventually or something. He was mad. He came and destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and any bits of the rock anywhere at near the tomb, he obliterated those too. He just wiped the whole thing clean. And so when the Crusaders came a little later, they rebuilt the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And what you see today in much of the church is from Crusader times and the Idicule, there was a fire, again, even later in the 19th century, there was a fire that has destroyed the Idicule there, and it had to be rebuilt yet again, this time in the 19th century, so what you see is 19th century. 
And there is the dome of the rotunda as it is today. So, if we go down and look at the edicule and look into it, what is there to see? Not a whole lot. This is called the cenotaph of the anastasy. So, cenotaph simply means an empty tomb, a tomb without a body. And there, there's some marble, and they say the, the, the body of Christ would have been placed on the right side. Well, maybe it would have been. There's nothing to show, because all the stonework you see is much less, centuries later, marble stonework put in afterwards. Excavations under the Church of the Holy Sepulchre have shown that there was indeed a quarry there, going way back, not only to Roman times, but much earlier. Uh, probably into Old Testament times. And in that rock quarry, there were tombs in the New Testament period. And that looks familiar. They've labeled that one the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. What's the evidence for that? Zero. <laughs> but it is a Jewish uh, co two kokim there. You can see there's a cork on the left and a cork on the right. The two kokim or loculi which was the very kind of tomb, as we saw yesterday, that was used at the time of Jesus. So that is definitely first century, um, second temple period, Jewish graveyard. No question about that. That's true. Also found by, in the excavations, excavated in 1971, was a stone with a drawing on it. And that, they reckon, was buried around 335 AD, fourth century. And it shows a boat. And there's a Latin uh, writing right underneath it. And there you are. And as you can re all read Latin very well, you can read clearly. It says, Domine Ibimus, which is, in fact, a quotation from Psalm 122, verse 1, which in the Latin Vulgate version is labeled Psalm 121, verse 1. Don't worry about that. In, in domum Domini Ibimus, in the house of the Lord, let us go. Let, in other words, we let us go to the house of the Lord, or we came to the house of the Lord. Uh, we came to the Lord, in the abbreviated ver version. So, but does that prove anything? Well, it shows it was an early place of pilgrimage in the fourth century. But we already know that, because Caswell Constantine built his church. So it doesn't prove anything. So, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, what have we got? From the 4th century until now, there is an unbroken history of this site. That's unchallengeable. Archaeology has shown it was a burial place in the 1st century and was outside the city walls, or there wouldn't have been those kokim, right? Did the, the question is this. Did the Christians keep an accurate knowledge of the site from the destruction of the city in the year 70 when the Christians there would certainly have known which was the tomb of Jesus until the year, uh, from there until the time of Constantine, which is a period of 200 years? The temple was destroyed, remember. The city was destroyed in the year 70, rebuilt in 135. Constantine didn't come in till the, his men until the 4th century. So that's the period that we need to challenge. Well now, was there an unbroken tradition? Tradition can be important, friends. Don't, don't think there's the New Testament 2,000 years ago, and then we've got the church today and Pentecost and all that, and there's nothing in between. There's 2,000 years of stuff there, guys, and some of it's history, some of it's written, some of it's archaeology, and some of it's tradition. But tradition is serious. You don't throw it out. You may do in the end, but look at it first. So, this is from Eusebius again. He says the bishops of Jerusalem, or the, the church leaders in Jerusalem were... James, the brother of Christ, in the New Testament period, we know that, we, that's in the Bible. And then Simeon, then Justus, Zacchaeus, Tobias, Benjamin, John, Matthias, Philip, Seneca, Justus, Levi, Ephraim, Joseph, and Judas. In other words, an unbroken tradition of leaders of the Jerusalem community up to the t a time of 135, and that these, were, all, he says, were not only all Christians, they were Jewish Christians, all through that period. 
From that time on, he in various places, and I've put the various, I've looked up the, all the different passages in life of Constantine and put, brought them together. So the list he gives is not an unbroken list like this. You have to go through his book and put it together. But the list turns out like this. Uh, Mark, Cassian, Publius, Maximus, Julian, Gaius, Symmachus, Gaius II, Julian II, Capito, Maximus II, Antoninus, Valens, Dolichian, uh, Narcissus, Alexander, Matsabanes, Hymenus, and so on. Right, you, you see, there's the list. And that takes us right up to Macarius, who was the, which is a Greek word meaning blessed. Uh, Macarius was the bishop of Jerusalem at the time of Constantine. And he's the man who comes and says, dig here, you'll find the Jewish tombs, the tomb of Jesus. And they might have said to Macarius, but you're showing us a place inside the city. You've got to be wrong. It's got to take us outside the city, they may have said. I don't know. That, this is speculation, but imagine it. Take us outside the city. He was crucified outside the city, buried outside the city. And Macarius said, I don't care where the, city, where the city wall is. This is the spot. Now, I'm not saying that happened, but something like that may have happened. He was so confident that right under that temple of Venus was the tomb of Christ. Was that right? Well, it, they dug down, they found a Jewish tomb. Um... Does that prove anything? No. It changes the likelihood. So, this would explain, this unbroken tradition of bishops would explain how in 325 to 326 AD, Bishop Macarius could confidently tell Constantine's men to dig a place inside the city walls since the days of Hadrian, 135, and they would uncover the tomb of Christ, inside Hadrian's walls. Is it possible to identify the location of the tomb of Jesus? Not with certainty. <laughs> Sorry, you came expecting it, I would give it to you. Can history and archaeology help us? Yes. Even though the final answer is not certain. Is the location essential evidence for the belief in the resurrection? No. The texts of the New Testament are the basis for this. The Christians were ready to die for what they claimed and for what they had written in the New Testament. And what was written. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, was it... Um, Gogel, who said, uh, one may die for an illusion, mais non pour un, uh, uh, but not for a, what was the word he used, for a hoax. I forget the French word that they use now. Uh, he, he said, you can be persecuted for a mistake, perhaps, mistaken belief, but not for a fraud. Mais non pour une fraude. That's what he said. And the Christians were prepared to die for it. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 6 and 20, Paul, this is, a, by the way, a, a, a mosaic of Paul from the 6th century mosaic in Capella San Andrea, Ravenna. If you ever get a chance to be in Italy and you get to Ravenna on the Adriatic coast, get to there and see the wonderful churches from the time of the, the uh, uh, Roman emperor uh, there. It, it's it's marvellous, the, the just, Roman emperor Justinian and the empress Theodora. Now, I'm getting off track. Paul says, Christ died, he was buried, and he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, when he wrote. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That's pretty strong to be able to get out on a limb and say that. Luke, in chapter, uh, Luke's Gospel Chapter 1, verse 2, he says he researched it from those who from the first were eyewitnesses. And the resurrection is absolutely dominant in Luke's gospel. And he says in Acts, which is volume 2, as you know, of Luke's writing, he, Christ, showed himself to these men and gave proofs he was alive. And there's much more we could give. The descriptions in the gospel, as we saw yesterday, fit observable facts. 
So it rings, the whole description rings true. On this, we base our belief in the resurrection. Now, it would be nice to be sure of the place. You probably gathered, I think it's likely the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But I think that that's a probable. Um, that's about as far as I'm prepared to go on it. My thanks to the Biblical Archaeology Society, to the Holy Land Photos, to the Garden Tomb Trustees, to Shimon Gibson, International Media Ministries, and the Map of Jerusalem to Magellan Geographics. Thank you very much. <laughs>